Our second reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So hear now God's word for you and for all of us today. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him... Bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, And they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. We thank you, O God, for this witness from Matthew's Gospel, which we have just read, and for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born in Bethlehem, adored of the Magi. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock, our strength, our hope, our love, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, we've turned the page on another year. The earth has completed another revolution around the sun, and we're still here. God has given us another day. We've made it to see the year of our Lord, 2023. And like the last few years, I did not make it to midnight. I suspect that's true for the vast majority of us, although there were quite a few in the choir who did. Um, We had some pretty exciting college football games to help us stay up, didn't we? Congrats to TCU and to Georgia, who will be playing in the national championship game. Uh, But I didn't watch any of them. I was certainly fast asleep by the end of the Georgia game and when the ball finally dropped. But New Year's, it's a joyous occasion, isn't it? We had fireworks ringing out in my neighborhood pretty much all night. I'm sure you heard some as well. The New Year, it can be a blank slate, a fresh start an opportunity to reset a time to make new priorities. And so with the new year comes New Year's resolutions, right? Did you make any this year? In doing a bit of research, I found out that the younger you are, the more likely you are to have New Year's resolutions. And that kind of made sense to me. Uh, We're young adults, the group most likely to have New Year's resolutions. That's ages 18 to 34. Uh, We're still trying to figure out this whole life thing, aren't we? 
So uh, I was also sad, I should mention that uh, this is my last year as a young adult. I was disappointed to learn that. <laughs> So uh, I guess next year I'm off the hook for a New Year's resolution. But uh, my New Year's resolution this year, having realized how important sleep is, not getting much these last seven months. Thankfully, my daughter is sleeping better. So my New Year's resolution is to get on a more consistent sleep schedule. And I'm grateful I'll be able to do that. But it's also pretty sobering, the statistics about New Year's resolutions and keeping them. Almost one quarter of people, about 23% who make New Year's resolutions, quit within the first week. Can you believe that? And only about a third of people make it past January. My goodness, if you're one of the third who make it past January, more power to you. Uh, perhaps I'll report back the next time I'm preaching to let you know how I'm doing with my sleep schedule. But this morning, as we said, we're also celebrating Epiphany. We journeyed with the wise men to see Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Epiphany, it's traditionally celebrated on January 6th, the last day of the Christmas season. And, and yes, Christmas is a season. It's not just a day. Remember the 12 days of Christmas? Uh, but we don't have a special service for Epiphany on January 6th that usually falls during the week, so uh, we bump it up to the first Sunday of the year, and here we are. Well, the Book of Common Worship, it's a resource we use for putting together these services. It, this is what it says about Epiphany. It says, Epiphany is the celebration of God's manifestation or self-revelation to the world in Jesus Christ. And the key phrase in that sentence is, to the world. You see, it's a fine margin of what we're celebrating between Christmas and Epiphany. Christmas is the celebration of God taking on flesh, the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. But very few people at Christmas know that this has taken place. It's basically just the Holy Family, the shepherds who have heard from the angels and the animals in the stable. God came in such a quiet, nondescript way that we also need to celebrate when word begins to filter out, out into the world. And that happens through the Magi, through the wise men, or as Jack said, wise people. We don't actually know that they were all men. The Book of Common Worship goes on to say, in particular, we celebrate the revelation of God's promise and purpose to the nations of the world. As the Magi came from the East to worship the Christ child, and God's covenant of grace is extended to all who believe in the good news of Christ Jesus. All who believe in the good news of Christ Jesus. Well, Matthew, he uses the Greek word magoi, translated as wise men or wise people in our text. That's how he describes these people journeying to see the baby in the manger. They're these mystical figures who have caught the attention of people throughout the ages. You see the, the artwork on the front of our bulletin, the Adoration of the Magi. There's been quite a tradition that's been built up, right? We see the, the three people on the camels who are journeying to see Jesus. And we think there are three because there are three gifts listed, right? The gold, frankincense, and myrrh but we don't know if there were more or not. But they were believed to be kings in the tradition of Christianity. They were even given names. Caspar, the king of India, Melchior, the king of Persia, and Balthazar, the king of Arabia. Well, a more modern consensus is that they were not kings, that a better way to describe them would be astrologers people who looked at the heavens, the celestial bodies. They watched and waited 
They saw an appearance and the movement of a star, and that's what draws them from their home out to see Jesus. They must have been people of some means, or at least adjacent to wealth, because these gifts that they bring, they were fit for a king, very appropriate for Jesus, the king of kings. And it's also important to note that they were Gentiles. They were Gentiles. Very early on in Jesus' story, we're told that the good news is for the whole world. All the nations shall rejoice at God taking on flesh in the Christ child. This is a whimsical and wonderful story. But what does it mean for us today? What can we learn from this text about our modern lives? Well, I have a few quick thoughts for us this morning. First, we should learn from Herod's negative example. Historically, we know that Herod was a cruel man. He was extremely paranoid, willing to do whatever it took to hold on to power. He had local leaders killed. He even went so far as to murder members of his own family, possibly his own children. He did not tolerate to live anyone who could possibly challenge his position. So when Herod, he calls this secret meeting with the wise men and asks that they return to him and disclose the location of the baby Jesus, he's lying to them when he says he wants to go and pay Jesus homage. The Magi refer to Jesus as king of the Jews, and this has piqued Herod's interests, but not in a good way. The Magi, they're warned not to return to him, and that confirms Herod's intentions. And we see what happens in the following chapter with the slaughter of the innocents. It shows his cruelty and his terror. You see, Herod, he fears change, the change that this baby will bring. He is terrified of this new thing that has happened, especially that it may weaken his position and his power. Change is scary. Change is hard. We don't like to change. We, I think, see that in the statistics about our New Year's resolutions, right? It's not easy to change. It's also not easy for us to accept change. But ultimately, God calls us to not fear change. God is the one who holds our future in his hands. And so we are called to welcome the new things that God may be doing in our lives. They say the only constant in life is change. And in our modern times, life seems to be changing at an ever faster rate, doesn't it? It's enough to give you whiplash. And of course, not every change is good. The point I'm trying to make is that we shouldn't outright reject something just because it's new or different than we expect. There's this popular show now, maybe you've watched it, maybe you haven't, but that doesn't matter. It's called Ted Lasso. And I love a line that the lead character shares. In one of the episodes, he says, be curious, not judgmental. Be curious, not judgmental. Herod, he was not curious. He was judgmental from the very beginning that he heard that someone else may be king. I hope we in this new year will be curious and not judgmental. Well, point two for us this morning, we need to be on the lookout for signs from God. That seems rather obvious, I think, but it can be easy to go about our daily lives without much thought. We have our routines. There is a lot going on in our lives that can 
overwhelm us. Sometimes we're just trying to get through the day. We can also be bombarded with information and noise that everything just kind of becomes a blur. But I hope we'll follow the example of the Magi. They were intentional about looking for signs. They looked to the heavens, to the stars and the sky. They saw the star at its rising. They discerned what it meant that an important child had been born. But it's important to note they still didn't have all the information that they needed. You see, they travel to Jerusalem and they ask a question, where is the child? They saw the star, they knew what it meant, but they weren't quite sure where they were going just yet. Where is the child? And so the chief priests and scribes, they look to Scripture, they study Scripture, and they find the answer. So a few things to highlight within this one point. The first being, we need to be alert. We also need to set aside time to be intentional about seeing the movement of God. Jack talked about that in our children's time. Setting aside time in quiet to hear God's voice. We can find signs both in nature and in Scripture. We need to stay close to God's Word, but we also must be attentive to what's going on in the world, what's happening in our daily lives. The people in our story, they also worked collaboratively. They worked together to find the answers that they needed. No one person had all the information. And so we, too, must discern together what the signs God are showing us is and what they might mean. This is a big part of why our Presbyterian polity does not put power to make decisions in just one person. We don't have bishops. We don't have popes. Although, quick side note, prayers to our Catholic siblings in Christ as they mourn the death of Benedict XVI. But you see, the very decision-making in our tradition, it's rooted in the idea that we best discern God's will together in community. Together, as a group, we need each other. It's important to be part of a community of faith. Well, the third part, point, finally, is that we need courage and faith to follow where God is leading us. The Magi, upon seeing the rising star, could have simply kept observing the heavens. They didn't need to go anywhere. They could have made notes. They could have recorded this sign in a journal, in a history book. They could have stayed home where they were comfortable. But instead, they chose to go. To travel, and I imagine that that journey was not an easy one. Traveling back then was both arduous and dangerous. But knowing what they saw, knowing what it meant, they couldn't help but travel to see the babe in the manger, the child who had been born a king. And so I think that calls us to ask ourselves. Where is God leading us? Where is God leading us today? What is our rising star? And that's a question not just for us collectively, that's a question for us individually as well. We have to figure that out for ourselves. We have to figure that out as a church. And so I hope we'll ask that question this new year. Where is God leading me? Where is God leading the First Presbyterian Church of Naples? Finding that answer is probably not the most difficult part, sadly. It's difficult, but it's not the most difficult. What will be most difficult is following through. It's one thing to know God's will. It's another to do it. To do it. So... 
As we begin this new year, I hope we'll all make a resolution. A resolution to ask ourselves, where is the rising star pointing me? To what is the rising star pointing us as a congregation? Like the Magi, may we journey together, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. May we follow the path that the star lights. For if we do, we can be assured that we will find Jesus there waiting for us, that we will be filled with joy when we see our Savior. May it be so. Amen.